thanks again for coming out. Um, welcome to uh, a presentation that we're going to have done by Mike uh, Martell. I traveled with Mike Martell a number of years ago. I've known him since I was a young lad. Uh, now he's retired and going around doing some presentations. And uh, I'd like everybody to give Mike a warm welcome here. <coughs> and he's going to do a speech. Uh, after he's done his speech, we'll have another gentleman uh, make another speech. And then you can ask any questions and mingle about after you are done your questions. And don't be shy. It's a great opportunity. Okay. Thank you very much. Come on up, Mike. Thank you very Thanks, much, buddy. Man. Thank you, man. For those of you who might not know me, let me introduce myself. My name is Mike Martell. I am the oldest son of Hen Marjorie and Henry Martell. Some of you might remember my dad. He was a musician at more house parties than I could count. Though I was born in Seaforth, Ontario, I spent the better part of my early years in Ponteville. Madame, after we moved there in 1970. I'm here to tell you a bit about my early years in Ponteville. The start of my mental health challenges when I was in high school and many years as an adult struggling to overcome those challenges in order to live a more normal life. I hope my story will help reduce the stigma associated with mental health issues and in some way uh, and in some way offer hope to those who may be living with me mental illness or caring for someone who is Pondville was a great place for me was a great place for a kid like me to grow up like other kids my age, I kept busy playing games like baseball, skating, tobogganing, and swimming with friends such as Dennis Boudreau, Glenn Kinslow, and Paul Maltby. I particularly remember playing ice hockey on an outdoor rink in Rocky Bay. A bunch of us would get together after a snowstorm and clear the ice with shovels. Then we'd start skating around, slapping the puck back and forth, pretending to be famous NHL players, scoring the winning goal in a Stanley Cup playoff game. The very best times were when we played at night under the lights, which were strung up and over the rink. It was friggin' cold. I don't mean cold. I mean friggin' cold. <laughs> but it was kind of magical racing down the ice on a breakaway, under the lights, under the stars, scoring goal after goal after goal. And all the girls in our imaginations screaming out our names. In the summer, in the spring and summer, I used to go fishing a lot at Grand Lake on, or out on the ocean with my dad's boat and my grandfather. The boat was called the Lucky Lady. And most of the time, we were lucky. We rarely came back empty. We rarely came back empty. We caught lots of mackerel, cod too, gave some away, froze some, and ate the rest. It didn't matter what the season, life for me in the early teens was great. Lots of friends, lots of things to do, and a great community to live in. I, have, I was having so much fun. I didn't see the darker clouds that were getting, that were gathering on the horizon, waiting to change me. When I got older, I went to high school at Alma Dam District High. Grade 10 was not too bad. I liked my English teacher, Mr. Roy Budrow, and my science teacher, Bernie Sampson. 
I did really well, getting good marks that year. But in grade 11, things started to change. I began, hearing, I began to hear voices in my head, upsetting voices. I got really confused. I found, it no, I, found I no longer wanted to be around people. No more pond hockey or baseball or heading out on the lucky lady. I started to withdraw from all that I was, from all that like a turtle, backing, pulling back into a sh its shell. When I did go out and found myself with other people, I started to think they were all talking about me, whispering about me, laughing at me. So I decided I would I just I decided to just stay home all the time. I felt safer there in my bedroom with my music than out on the street or with friends or in crowds of strangers. It was pretty it was a scary and lonely time for me. <clears throat> with my father's encouragement I went to Ontario for a summer job. I think my father hoped that a change might do me good. He also wanted me to go, to get he also wanted to get me out of my room and give me a chance to make some money. I got a job working in a factory that made parts for fire trucks. That summer of work went pretty well. But when I came home to finish high school, I found things became even more difficult th than before. Everything was so hard in my head. I couldn't focus on my tasks, couldn't concentrate. I w was always confused about what I was supposed to be doing. My thoughts were scrambled and I had taken drafting for three years in high school. And after I graduated, I went to write a test to get into drafting at the Canso Regional Vocational School. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't figure out anything. I tried working at Canadian Tire, but the voices in my head were too loud. I couldn't focus on what I was supposed to be doing. I was freaking out. So I quit. Year after year after year, it was like that for me. I would start to do something and the voices in my head were, I would start do, doing something and the voices in my head or, or paranoia would be too strong for me and I would have to quit. I was very sick throughout those years. They were hard on me, my, everyone, dad, mom, and me. Finally, my mom and dad encouraged me to go to a doctor in Antigonish, a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist diagnosed me with paranoid schizophrenia and admitted me to the Nova Scotia Hospital in Dartmouth. I don't remember much about in the, being in the hospital the first time, probably because I was on a lot of medication. And when I returned the following year, I was given shock treatments. And when I woke up from them in my room, for the first time in a long time, I felt awake. It was as if someone had opened my window curtains and my room was suddenly filled with sunlight. I felt clear and energetic, like the, my old day, like my old self again, like getting out of bed on the first warm day of spring and after a long hard winter. What a change for me for, and for my parents. A while later, 
I had an appointment with Scott McGilvery, a psychologist at St. Anne Center in Arishat. After seeing him a number of times, Scott asked me if I would consider moving to a group home in Antigonish. I said no the first time, but he was persistent. The second time, he asked, I agreed to go. I was interviewed by Celtic Community Council, and they felt I would be capable of living in my own apartment with their assistance. Like the song says, I was going down the road, yeah, baby. <laughs> For the first time in a long, long time, I felt motivated to do things. For the first time in a long, long time, I felt good about myself. I had energy and motivation, lots of it. I walked to the group home. I walked to the nursing, RK nursing home where I volunteered. I walked to the municipal building to take classes. And all the while, I became more and more active in the kitchen at the group home. I started to think maybe I could turn my focused fondness for cooking into a career. Maybe I wasn't going to be that NHL hockey star of my youth, with all the women screaming my name. Maybe I was going to be some kind of chef. I put in an application for cooking at the cooking course at NSCC in Port Oxbury. And at this time, I was accepted. In 2011, graduate, I graduated from NSCC with, a cooking, with my cooking certificate. My mom and dad were there the day I graduated. After so many years they had spent caring for me, worrying about me, they were pretty proud of how far I had come. I was pretty proud of myself too. I, I, it was such a relief to finally be a person who could do something well, something other people valued. I immediately started to look for work in Antigonish and was interviewed by Chef Mark Gabriel at Gabriel's Bistro. I was nervous. Gabriel's was a pretty high-class restaurant, but after my interview, chef looked at me and said, come into work on Monday. I had a job. The guy who couldn't hold down a regular job for so many years had a job, and a good job, in a classy restaurant. Working at Gabriel's proved to be very reward, a very rewarding experience for me. I made some money, which was great. But even more than that, I loved what I was doing. My boss knew I was a loyal employee. He could count on me to show up and do great work. And I always felt like I belonged working there. I was part of a team, an important part of a team. And Chef showed me his appreciation many times. Twice he paid for me to fly to Ontario so I could visit family. He gave me time off work when it was needed. He was also there for me, always supporting me. After 21 years of working with Chef, I finally retired a few months ago. It had been a great, relation, great partnership for the both of us. He changed my life. Thanks to him, I had had a career, something I thought so many, peop so many years would ne never be possible. <clears throat> In 2007, I was nominated for the Nova Scotia Inspiring Lives Award. I was one of four Nova Scotians who won the award that year. Some very good friends took me to Halifax to receive my award. 
The award was for all the challenges I had overcome, all the things I had achieved, like graduating from NSCC and working at Cabrios. If you had told me years before, during my dark times, that one day I would be told by the province I was an inspiration to other people facing similar challenges, I would have told you, you not to be so foolish. But sometimes life has a way of surprising you. And some and surprises for me just kept coming. A few years after receiving that Inspiring Lives Award, I was approached by a mental health nurse at St. Martha's Hospital and asked if I would be interested in helping reduce the stigma associated with mental illnesses by playing in a play, by being in a play. Well, I was used to chopping vegetables, chop, 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 chop. <laughs> but, I never, but I had never thought of myself as an actor. Nevertheless, I said I would do it. I joined a group of five other adult anti Ganesh adults who were also living with schizophrenia. We were called, we were created, the play we created was called I Get By With a Little Help from My Friends. The old Beatles song, some of you in the audience might still remember. It was, it was a great name for the play because living with a serious mental illness can be really hard and having support and understanding of others. People like Chef Gabriel can make a huge change, huge difference. We called ourselves the Park Bench Players and after about a year or so of rehearsals, we felt we were ready to put on a performance. We wanted to try and educate people about mental is health issues. We wanted to bring those issues out of the darkness and into the light. We were going to do that by telling our own stories as honestly as we could. We decided we would put on one performance and that it would be for our family and friends only. We were nervous about how the public audience might respond to what we had to say. We were nervous about having the courage to talk publicly about our illnesses. Well, we didn't need to be nervous. The play was a ginormous hit. Our message was heard and appreciated. What was meant to be a one performance show turned into 11 years and over 100 wonderful performances all over Nova Scotia. We performed in schools, universities, prisons, churches, curling rinks, private homes, convention centers, even the provincial legislature. We performed for audiences of well over 500 and audiences less than 20 didn't matter. No matter where we performed, there were always standing ovations and always audience members who approached us after our show to thank us for talking about mental health so honestly or to share their own struggles with people with mental health problems. Often, those conversations we had with audiences audience members after the show we were the most moving part of the evening. In 2011 we were chosen by the National Psychosocial Rehabilitation Canada organization as winners of the National Award of Excellence. Out of every other city, every other mental health project in all of Canada the park bench players were chosen as the best program in the entire nation to, 
to address the stigma associated with mental illness. Thank you. Number one in the entire nation, that award of excellence was to be presented in Vancouver for three weeks with the help of Nova Scotians near and far. Over $14,000 was raised, allowing us all to fly to Vancouver to receive the award in person. We stayed there for three days and nights. It was one of the best times of my life. And we went and we came back from the big city on the west coast to the little town on the east coast. Andy Ganesh held a parade through Main Street in our honor. We were not hockey players or Highland dancers or big shot politicians. We were six people living with a serious mental illness and the town was proud of us and we were proud of ourselves. We felt like we were no longer invisible. People we didn't know would come up to us on the street and thank us for what we were doing. We started to think of ourselves as agents of change, stigma busters. We were making a difference, not just in, one, not just in our own lives, but in the lives of all kinds of other people too. The players went on to win two more national awards over the following years, along with a number of provincial and local awards for our efforts. We were preparing to celebrate performance number 101 when COVID hit. That's when we took our final bows and sadly left the stage for the last time. We had planned on doing only one show. We ended up doing 100. It took a pandemic to stop us. Being a park bench player, taking our message of hope and support to so many people over so many years has made me feel confident that things can get better for people living with a mental illness or caring for someone who is. I have been fortunate. I did get by with a little help from my friends, F friends like my mom and dad and my teachers, friends like Chef Mark Gabriel, my doctors and nurses and, other, and the other park bench players, the strangers on the street who congratulated us and the audience members who over the years have shown their own struggles with us. We get by with a little help from our friends, ladies and gentlemen, people like you. My name is Mike Martell, eldest son of Marjorie and Henry Martell. I am living in Pontville. I am from Pontville, Alma Dam, and proud of it. Some people say I am schizophrenic. I tell them they are wrong. I am a person living with schizophrenia. I am so much more than my illness, so much more. I would ask you to keep that in mind the next time we meet on the street and keep that in mind when you meet anyone else living in, who is living with a mental illness. We are people, people in need of support, kindness, understanding. It is a hard road to walk for those living with a mental illness and for those caring for people who are living with a mental illness. It is so much better to walk the road carrying, caring, so much better to walk that road with a caring community. So much better than walking alone. Thank you for inviting me here today to tell my story. It had been a kind of homecoming for me. My message of, is one of hope and one of caring. Remember, we get by with a little help from our friends. Thank you for offering me your friendship 
by listening to me today. It feels good to be home. I guess Jim is going to come up now. Jim Mulcahy, he's going to talk a little about everything. Where's Jim? He must, oh, there he is. He's slowly making his way up here. <laughs> Mike, Mike asked if I would just come up and explain a little bit about the park bench players, how they came to be, and the uh, difference it's made in the lives of individuals. Uh, my name is Jim Mulcahy. I taught until... Uh, Mr. Cancer made me a visit in Antigonish for 33 years, originally from Halifax. And uh, towards the end of one of my illnesses, I'm working on my third cancer at the moment, uh, I was approached by a couple of individuals in the hospital because I had taught drama in the high school in Antigonish. And uh, they asked me if perhaps I could participate in developing a play that might address the issues connected to the stigmas associated with mental health issues. <clears throat> uh, I was eager to do so because I had been forced to retire. I still wanted to be a teacher, but the cancer prohibited me from doing that. Uh, initially, what we tried to do was interview a number of high school students in the area and gather their stories. And I would write a script based on those stories and then we would audition it to other high school players, and then we would tour it, particularly among the high schools. So we did meet with a number of kids, grade 10, 11, and 12, who were experiencing significant illnesses, be it depression, anxiety, uh, schizophrenia, illnesses that were troubling them, uh, embarrassing them, shaming them, prohibiting them from participating in the lives of other teenagers uh, and therefore were in need of being praised, praised rather than shamed. We had the interviews, I started to develop the skits and the kids backed out. And that points out to you something that Mike uh, talked about in his address very difficult and very different to be living with a mental illness than a physical illness. I remember teaching multiple times where a kid would break his ankle or break his arm skiing or falling off a tree. Guess what? That kid came to school the next day with the cast on his arm because he wanted everybody to sign it. Okay? It was a story that he was proud of telling or at least it was something that he was not embarrassed about or prohibiting him from living a normal life. But a mental health issues are often different than that. They are often kept hidden. So the kids suffer alone, and these kids, although they were not going to be telling their own stories, felt they could not even have their stories told because somebody sooner or later would recognize them and perhaps give them a hard time. That collapsed, that failed, that effort. So then we went to <clears throat> the uh, director of adult mental health and the director of uh, adolescent mental health and asked if perhaps we could solicit a number of individuals in the community, adults who were living with mental health issues, and bring them in. And instead of auditioning other people to tell their stories, they would do it themselves. And we had six people who volunteered. Sir Mike of the Bike came riding in on his bike, okay, like a knight in shining armor. Uh, Stacy Sefton, who is at the back here, also came in. He's another one of our players. Yeah. Uh, we had uh, Fran Nunn, uh, who played the part of uh, fabulous Fran, the fortune teller. Outrageous. Anybody who's seen the play. Outrageous behavior. Uh, and Louise Hall. And who did I miss? Pat Chisholm. And we spent about a year developing a script. They told me their stories. I would sit down with them and try to create a script. Uh, they told me that there were only two things. Well, the main thing I remember was it had to be fun. It had to be funny. No preaching. So if anybody has seen the play, 
you remember that there were quite a few scenes in the play that were comedy more than serious, okay? Uh, one of the first opening ones is that Pat Chisholm was sitting on the park bench. All we had on stage was a park bench, okay? Pat Chisholm was, was an artist, and so he was sitting here, Fran Nunn was sitting there, and Big Mike came out to try to sit down with them. And so he would come in and move his large house down onto the bench and shimmy the other players away with his bum. Okay? And that usually got a laugh and started to indicate the kind of atmosphere we were trying to create. We weren't going to beat people over the head of the sadness of this thing. We weren't going to ignore it, but we wanted to do it in a kind of com comedic fashion. And it worked. There were some very serious moments. Each of the players read a monologue that's very, very serious. The monologue at the very middle, Mike referenced in his very closing lines. And uh, I would ask you, as a writer-director of these characters I've been with for now 12, 14 years, to remember what Mike said. What do you said at the end there? Uh, he's not a schizophrenic, ladies and gents. It's one of the few mental illnesses we speak of in that way. We don't say to a person who's anxious, you're an anxious. We don't say to a person uh, who is living with uh, ADHD, you're an ADHD. We don't say to a person who's depressed, you're depressed. We don't. But for some strange reason, when it comes to schizophrenia, we say he's a schizophrenic. We identify the person exclusively with their illness. And what Mike is asking and what the players asked at the very heart of things is that you identify them as a person first who's living with that mental illness, okay? And as Mike said, there's so much more to him, so much more than just the illness. And that was proven over and over and over and over again in the shows that we did all over Nova Scotia. Again and again and again, we would have people come up after the shows and want to talk to the players and share their own stories. High school students who had never disclosed to anybody, including their parents, what they were dealing with, would come up and speak to the players because they Players gave them the courage to come up and tell their stories, often tearfully, often in tears. Uh, adults, the same way. One night we had, did the play for a group of people. On one side were the people living with serious mental illness. On the other side were the people caring for them. And that was an incredible m night for us because it's difficult, hard, hard to be a parent, it's heartbreaking to be a parent trying to help somebody who's living with a significant mental illness. And it's heartbreaking to be that person. Tough. But we kept the theme in terms of having fun. Uh, we went to Vancouver. It was crazy being on the streets of Vancouver, all of us with our jackets. People thought we were a gang. We had park bench players written on the back of our jackets that we had. And we were down on the beach. We were right on the harbor. And we were down on the beach, uh, sitting on the beach and whatever. Uh, anybody, anybody from Anaganish or knows Anaganish, there's a restaurant called The Wheel, and it sells pizzas. We took pizza boxes with us from The Wheel. And we put them down on the beach and opened them up so the seagulls would come and eat out of those. And then we took pictures. You know, so when we went back to Antigonish, we took him to the guy, uh, Mike, who owns the wheel, and showed him that the, even the seagulls in Vancouver liked his pizzas. You know, <laughs> it was fun. But as we were walking back up this busy, busy street on a beautiful October day, there was this guy leaning up against the lamppost, and I was walking in the rear of this, and he was leaning up the well, lamppost, and he had tattoos from the top of his head down to the top bottoms of the feet. <laughs> He was a hard rock guy. I wasn't going to mess with him. He would look like trouble, okay? And then the players go by, the players go by, and this guy was looking at them, 
And he turned to me and he said, well, who are those guys anyway? Well, I said, they're schizophrenics, I used to think. And he ran away. <laughs> he took off. He was afraid of the people living with schizophrenics as opposed to other guys who were tough guys, you know. It was a lesson for me that that word carries such power that it frightened even a character like that. But we, we had a ball. And Mike has a line in a play that he didn't say here, but 3,000 miles to get to Vancouver. And one of the players that came with us, Fran, spent the, her free time going to yard sales. And that was Mike's line in the call. He, go, he went 3,000 friggin' miles to go to a friggin' yard sale. <laughs> and she did. She did. Uh, I was very sick when the players started. I was very sick emotionally, second cancer, crummy prognosis, had to quit my job. My wife was sick and later died of the illness that she was sick with. It was a very challenging time in my life and the life of my kids. Three of my kids had been inherited the same disease that killed my wife and will die from it. And I suddenly was introduced to this gang of ruffians the crowd, the likes of this character here, oh, and Stacy and Fran, and they, they literally saved my life. Working with these people, but saved my life. I always tell our audiences that before I started to try to negotiate and direct Mike, I had hair down to hair. <laughs> and it just came out in lumps. Like that, uh, uh, you know, we were we were kind of careful about how we used the word crazy. You can understand why we would, you know, because it's a word that for them was a wounding word. Uh, but we were crazy all the time. <laughs> it was just, you know, it was silly. It took us a year to get down a three-act play. But I would have imagined it would have taken us a month at most of that because we were so foolish all the time. And we rehearsed in our basement, my basement, and uh, my wife, who was ill, uh, adored them and came down and sat with them. And it was wonderful for me. We did 100 shows. She was able to, to travel to 70 of them before her illness wouldn't allow her to travel any longer. And they were wonderful with, them, with her, pushing her wheelchair around, etc. I guess what I want to communicate to you, and we were talking about this earlier, uh, this sense of community, eh? You have it here. This hall is incredible. And what you do with this hall is incredible. And I was congratulating this gentleman who tried hard to get us to come here, and we ran out of time. But I think this is just a fabulous community. You get the sense of community as soon as you come in here. Uh, we, we had that with the players. We had this little tight community of people who endured a lot together, had a wonderful successes together, and it came to an end because of the pandemic. But just keep in mind what Mike wants you to think about. I don't think, I'm making a guess here, but I'm just guessing because based on experience, I strongly suspect that in this room, all of you, if not all of you, many of you are aware of some individual within your extended family, perhaps, or within your community, who was struggling with a mental health issue. I'd be surprised if it wasn't the case. What Mike is asking you to do is to be patient, is to provide support, kindness, understanding. And that's not easy all the time. As Mike said when he was hiding in his, face, in his room, listening to music, day after day, year after year, year after year, I imagine that was really hard on the mom and dad. But his final message was one of things can change. Hold on to that hope uh, and take care of yourself as a caregiver while you're trying to take care of that relative, that friend, that community member. I'm tremendously proud of these characters. Uh, it was heartbreaking for me that we had to stop, but we did. Uh, Mike's taking his show on the road as a one-man stage production. 
Oh, uh, he's meeting with uh, people in the medical community, talking about his story so that perhaps they understand better how best to approach people who are living it. We met, by the way, one thing we didn't mention, we met for a year with uh, various groups of Mounties. Uh, because the Mounties had almost no training in how to respond to a call that involved people who were mentally ill. And if any of you read the American uh, press, you'll know that probably 80% of the time when their police forces approach somebody who's dealing with a mental health issue, that guy ends up dying. So we met with the Mounties uh, over the length of a year, frequently, and trying to communicate to them how best to approach individuals such as themselves who might be living with an illness and are troubled and how to approach them. Well, they've done a lot. They changed me, they saved my hide. They've changed numerous other people. Uh, their play was tremendous success. They did what they set out to do, uh, was to break, the, break down the stigma associated with mental health illness. And as Mike said, they brought it out of darkness into the light. Uh, and they were not invisible any longer. Why did we call ourselves the park bench players? Because they used to spend all their time on the park benches in the, in the community of Anaganish, having their cigarette or whatever, watching the crowds go by. And then suddenly they were people, they were important people. Imagine Anaganish having a parade for people living with schizophrenia. <laughs> picture that. I mean, with a hockey stick, you can picture that, right? You can see that. St. of X, maybe a football team, you can see that. Well, here we got six people living with schizophrenia. We're having a parade for them? You know, hard to believe. Imagine Vancouver saying, come on out here. Of all the cities and towns in Canada, all the hospitals in Canada that presented or were developing programs to address mental health issues, and all of them, Anaganish, do it for your Anaganish. One. And you, and I just think about that. Not worth getting sick for, but it's worth celebrating. <laughs> I have to thank you all, and I have to thank the, whole, the, the, the fact that you've come out today on behalf of not only Mike and Stace, but all of the other players who couldn't be here today. Uh, keep that message that Mike gave you. I am enormously proud of this guy. Uh, when, he, when he thought we were going to go to Pondville, you know, and do a show for people, like he said, it was like a homecoming. Uh, he was nervous all the way coming down here in the car. Uh, we rehearsed it several times, but uh, he's enormously proud of his heritage, of his mom and dad. One of the shows we did was for your mom. Not a big audience, but we presented it to her. Uh, your dad, did he come to play? Yeah, yeah. And now all your friends and neighbors are here today. So I'm going to shut up, which is what Mike used to do. Tell me. <laughs> and, uh, but I just want you to know about how proud I am of this, this person who was raised here in this community uh, and had an enormously challenging struggle for the better part of his life. And through his own discipline, uh, his own determination, and the support of many, many people has turned into uh, not the hockey player, okay, but the women screaming his name, but he still dreams of that, okay, okay. as the most Canadian boys. Uh, but a man who has changed the lives of people far as Vancouver uh, to cancel guys from the North Coast. Uh, one last time, our last station to stand, and Mike to stand and take a bow. So if anybody's got any questions, uh, Michael will answer or do his best to answer anything that people have. And also there's still food and coffee over there. If anybody wants more coffee, more food or to mingle, be my guest. No rush time on here at all. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks man. Thanks, man.
<clears throat> Anybody have any questions they'd like to ask me? Hi, Mike. Hi. Your presentation was inspiring. What is your key to wellness? Like, what things should I incorporate in my life, in my daily life, that you can define mm -hmm. and help me reach those goals? Mm. Well, for me, it was determination. I had to keep myself busy. I found that a very, a very important thing to do. And that gave me m more incentive to, to do things that I achieved, like going to college or, or being in a play or talking to people. And I just kept busy doing things, and it just kind of grew on me, and especially with the play because it gave me more confidence in myself. I could be walking down Main Street in Annie Ganesh, and people would say hi to me. I wouldn't even know them. And I'd say, you must have seen the play. And they'd say, yes, they did. And I, I just got recognized so much that it, it really made me feel good. <coughs> what, was, what was the onset of your disease? Mm -hmm. So you said one, you know, you stopped going around people. Yes. Like, did this happen all of a sudden? Were you diagnosed with schizophrenia right away? Or was it something was, that was diagnosed over a period of time? Well, when I first got diagnosed, uh, I think it happened pretty fast, pretty quick, because I, uh, I remember being in a car. I won't mention any names or anything, but I was in a car, and I, was, I used to smoke dope back then. And uh, this guy was in the car. I didn't know who he was, and he had lit up a joint, and it was... There was uh, angel dust in it. I didn't know that. And right after smoking that, that just uh, blew me away. That it, I think that's what the main part of it, and stress too. You know, was a was a big thing. I know my particular illness. It all started with depression. Did, did similar things happen to you that precipitated your diagnosis? Well, after I was sick uh, I was suffering I still do suffer from the depre depression and I would bring me down you know I didn't feel like doing much I felt really like uh, seasonal affective disorder so something like that maybe and then I went to the doctor and got prescribed uh, medications like uh, antidepressants and that has helped me along the road really good and the medications a big thing I find people that if people don't need take their medications with a mental illness well, that could be a very bad scene, bad story for them. But I've been on a really good taking my meds and did well for myself. Yes, Anne? Do you miss working at the restaurant, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, now that I retired, I did at first miss, the, I missed working there, yeah. yeah. But now I, I, I don't miss it, I, I love it. I, I can do, it and do whatever I want with yeah. my girlfriend, Tony. Yeah, excellent. When you were playing pond hockey, um, were you in es, uh, es, Escus here, uh, Escus. around here? Did you, did you leave? Did you have to leave here and go to schools in other parts of Canada? Or was it, or were you always coming back here every vacation? Or? No, I'll tell you, Stacy. Uh, my dad was in the Air Force, as many of you already know, but he was in the Air Force and he retired, and then that was in 1971, but, and we moved down here in 1970, and that's when I started playing po ice hockey down here and pond hockey, when we moved down, yeah. <laughs> I won't answer that. <laughs> no, I like Toronto, actually. <laughs> No, I don't think because because of Jim and and and, and friend on too. She's she's uh, she was our main actor in the play, and she took she uh, ended up being in the hospital where she's at now at Saint Martha's, and uh, she's going to be going to a nursing home. So the, the play is finished. I wish you guys could all could see it though. I'm sure you would love it. I have it recorded. Maybe you know you guys got a screen back here, right? 
Yeah, and I'd be glad to come here and show everybody the, the play. And that would be a... Yes, I would do that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And we'll try and work on the... Uh, on uh, coming here and showing you guys all the play. And if you'd pass the word along too when you hear about it, you'll get lots of people here and we'll have a, lots of laughs when you see it too. <laughs> so I guess that's it, is it? I think that's it.